book of Genesis, Shalom, and do not be afraid. Uh, the goal will be to get through the first 25 verses of chapter 43. Chapter 43 and 44 really are a whole. In fact, 45 is almost part of the same whole. A lot of times in Genesis, we'll go through years in one verse. We'll go through seven years just in one verse. Uh, not the case now. We're going to slow down and look at a whole lot of detail that happens in a very short period of time. But before we do that, a little housekeeping. So last week, we had the question about the age difference between Joseph, the 11th born son uh, of Rachel, her first son, and Benjamin, the second born son of Rachel, the 12th born son overall. I told you I did not know, but I would look it up. Pam, good morning. Good to see you. Um, so here's what we do know. We don't know exactly the difference, but I'll tell you what we do know. We do know that Joseph was born at the end of the 14 years in Padan Aram when Jacob was working for Laban. Seven years for Leah, seven years for Rachel. Jacob, or excuse me, Joseph was born at the end of that 14 years. And you can read about that in Genesis 30, 24, and 25. Hold that away. Six years later, they would leave the promised land. You can read about that in Genesis 31, 41. So at that point, um, Joseph would have been about six. Very good. Sherry got it. Um, Joseph met Esau. You remember the whole story. We won't retell it. Coming back from Padan Aram in Genesis 33. And he stopped short of crossing the Jordan and settled and built a house in Succoth. You can read about that in Genesis 34, 17. Remember, we talked all about that. We don't know how long he was there. Let's just say a year because he did build a house. So he's probably at least there a year. Um, so that makes Joseph now seven or eight, somewhere in there. Um, they leave from Succoth and move to Shechem, Genesis 34, 18. You remember the whole debacle with Shechem, where they circumcised the men and then Simeon and Levi killed them all? Probably were not there very long. That was a complete debacle. They left Shechem under God's direction and moved to Bethel, Genesis 35, 1. Let's imagine that by now Joseph is eight or nine. Um, they then moved from Bethel to Bethlehem, and Rachel dies on the way to Bethlehem, giving birth to Benjamin. Um, so eight to ten years would be the best estimate. So as you think about that, where we pick up today, two years in the famine, Joseph is 39. That means that Benjamin is 30-ish, right? If you just say 39, just take away nine, 30-ish, right in that area. Okay, does that make sense? That becomes the question. Does him being 30 make sense? Well, we're going to see a reckoning of the people who leave Canaan to go to Egypt, which is going to happen here within the next couple of months. In the reckoning, here's what we're told about Benjamin. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela, Becker, Ashbel, Gera, uh, Naaman, e Ehi, Rosh, Muppin, Hupam, and Ard. He had 10 sons. So he was for sure at least 30 probably. So a good age for this, for the difference between them, eight to 10 years, and everything aligns to that. So Pam, I think you asked that question, wherever Pam is, thank you for that. Eight to 10 years is the best answer I have. It's at least seven. It has to be seven. And Jacob was 17 when he was thrown into the pit. So you, that's the outer edge as well. So eight to 10 is where we land. Um, I had planned to next, as you know, I've been going through archeological evidence. Don't worry about it, Rob. I've been going through archaeological evidence, really building the case and showing you how we see Canaanites going into Egypt. We see the early Israelite tribe, family tribe going to Egypt. I showed you what they believe is Jacob's tomb. I've showed you a lot of different things. I wanted to show you some other things today, but we're a little over on the time, so I want to be careful with the lesson time. So I'm going to save that to the end. If we have time, I'll show you that. If not, I'll kick it to next week. Um, the, ne the next place we were going to go is, is there evidence of slavery? Is the evidence that this, it, this nation that enjoyed the blessings of Egypt when they first got there, and the conditions changed, and no longer were they enjoying the blessings, but they were becoming impoverished. They were becoming slaves. Is there evidence that boys were being killed prematurely? So I'll bring all that, Lord willing, either at the end of the lesson, time permitting, or next week, time permitting. Uh, but I, I don't want to front load it now because I'm a little worried about our time. So I'll save all of that. So I'm going to jump a couple of slides real quick. So just pretend you didn't see any of this. Okay, there we go. So just pretend none of that happened to get us to our lesson this morning. So last week we saw Jacob had sent his 10 sons to Egypt to buy grain. The famine was waxing strong in the land of Canaan, in the land of Egypt, in the land of the surrounding nations. We observed as they were in line to get grain, 
that Joseph recognized them. He saw the ten. Now, they didn't recognize him, but he recognized them. And you'll notice he spoke harshly to them. He didn't reveal who he was. Rather, he acted the part. He acted like the second most powerful man in Egypt. He acted like the vizier. He acted like the prime minister. He made four times he made the accusation, you are spies, right? We saw it over and over again. And he gave them the test to prove that they were not spies, and that was that they would bring their younger brother back, Benjamin. He had asked them questions. He had ascertained that they had a little brother. Now, let's be honest. When he saw the ten of them there, the first thing that went through his mind is, where's Benjamin? Why is my blood brother Benjamin not among them? Have they done to my blood brother Benjamin what they did to me? Have they sold my brother into slavery? Is that why he's not here? Worse still, have they killed him? Is that why he's not here? He knew the scoundrels they were. He knew how they behaved. He saw what Levi and Simeon did in Shechem. So he was worried. So he set up a test to really understand What's going on with Benjamin? And the test was, if you remember at first, he said, Benjamin has to come here before you'll go. Then he changed and said, I'll tell you what, one of you can go and 11 can stay. Then he told him, I tell you what, because I fear Elohim, one has to stay and 11 get to go. And then he bound Simeon in front of them. We talked about why not Reuben. We covered all that, so I won't retell all that this week. But we understand where we are. We ended the lesson last week. So the boys got back home. One man had learned that his money was in his bag on the way back. The other 11, as they're rehearsing the story with dad, and they're pouring out the grain, yeah, the Lord of the land said this, and he was a real mean guy, and he spoke gruff, and they're pouring out the grain to get it loaded up and stored, and everybody's money's hitting the floor. And fear gripped their hearts. And those boys were hoping to grab Benjamin and take him back to Egypt. Guess what? The game had now changed. And here's what we read. But he, that's Jacob, said, my son, that's Benjamin, shall not go down with you, for his brother's dead. That's Joseph. He believes Joseph is dead. They lied to him all these 22 years. And he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you take, uh, and he's referring to Benjamin, uh, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. He looks at those boys and says, it is not happening. He is not going to Egypt with you. That's where we left off last week. By way of reminder, looking at the life of Joseph, he was 30 years old when he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. He was immediately released. The seven years of plenty passed by in one verse, just like it never happened. We moved into the years of famine. He would have been 37 to 44 during the time of the famine. Where we find ourselves today is the second year into the famine. He is 39 years old, and we've determined that Benjamin is about there we are. In your notes, you have a 27-point outline of chapters 43, <laughs> forgive me, 43 and 44. That's why we're not getting through all of chapter 43 today, is there's so much stuff going on here that we need to look at. I do intend to get you through the first 10 points of that 27-point um, outline, but you have that in your notes. So that's the setup. They're back home. They're back in Haran. Jacob has determined Benjamin is not going with you, but we know what he does not know. The famine has five more years to go. What happens now? We all know the story, but we'll pretend like we don't as we ease into it. Any questions before we pick up at verse 1 of 43 and walk through the text? Okay, let's get at it. Shalom and do not be afraid. Verse 1, now the famine was severe in the land. Now, this is exactly what Joseph told Pharaoh. This is exactly what we know to be true. In fact, if you remember how Joseph described the famine to Pharaoh, he said there's going to be these seven years of plenty, but the seven years of want are going to be so severe that it will make the seven years of plenty look like they never happened. I made the joke and said it's like a surf pro commercial, like it never happened. But we get the point. They're going to be so severe. The, the famine is going to be so severe that all the plenty that they enjoyed for those years is going to evaporate. But it was those years where Joseph was collecting a fifth, just like he had told Pharaoh a wise and discerning person should do. He is indeed doing. But now we're looking at the famine in the land of Canaan, in the promised land. Now we're looking at the famine from the perspective of the fledgling family tribal nation of Israel. And the 
famine is severe in the land. It continues to wax severe. Guess what? Jacob had no idea how long it would remain severe. Verse 2. And when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again and buy us a little food. Now we can picture this, right? They're running out of grain. He's watching the grain <laughs> reserves go down. He musters up the boys. Simeon's locked up. Joseph is dead as far as he understands. Benjamin, he has no intention of sending. So he says, you nine need to go and buy us a little grain that we don't starve to death. Now, again, we're not talking about a trip to 7-Eleven or Aldi's here. We're talking about a journey from Hebron to somewhere in the Nile Basin. I just landed it right around Cairo just to give us a place to land. That's 250 miles. That's 250 miles across the desert. That's 250 miles with a caravan of donkeys that are going to bring all the corn, the grain back. This is a long trip. If you remember, I did my research on that website known for detailed research, donkeyonfarm.com. And donkeyonfarm.com, they said on average, a donkey can travel about 15 miles a day. Obviously, it depends on his age, the conditions, and the weight he's carrying, but on average, about 15 miles a day. Well, that's 17 miles or 17 days each way. The decision to go to Egypt and buy grain is a decision that involves traveling for a month, 34 days, in, through perilous terrain to another nation to secure food. It's a big deal. It's not a minor decision. But we're told, what else is he going to do? Put yourself in Jacob's shoes for a minute. This is happening to you and your family. You're running out of food. There's food in Egypt, 250 miles away, 17 days by a donkey. What would you be doing? Probably what he was doing, praying. You would be praying, God, end the famine. God, break the famine. God, release Simeon. God, don't make Benjamin go down there. God, do this. God, do that. I have no doubt he was praying. You ready for this? God has a totally different plan. The whole time he's praying one direction, God is moving in another. Never forget that. Just because God is not moving in the direction you want him to move does not mean he is not moving on your behalf. Just because the situation and the circumstances do not line up with where you think they should go does not mean God is not hearing you and he's not responding. Jacob probably felt like he was caught in a whirlwind of disaster. And he was right where the sovereign God wanted him to be. It seemed out of control from his perspective. It was in God's control the whole time. And that's a great lesson for us. You see, in our times of trouble... God is doing more than just taking us through the event. James expressed it this way. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into diverse temptations, diverse trials, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, entire, lacking nothing. Now, for the folks who are new with us, I quote the King James and show you the ESV. It's, I, I read the King James for so many years. Now they're both blended in my head together in many ways. But we get the point. When trials come into our life, might it not only might be going a different direction than we imagined, but God's doing something in us too. Never forget that. He is trying to grow our faith and our alliance on Him. And that's what we're going to see today. We've talked a whole lot about how God is working in the life of Joseph. God is working in the life of Joseph. God is working in the life of Joseph. You ready for this? He's working in the life of Jacob. He's working in the life of Judah. He's working in the life of Simeon. He's working in the life of Reuben. He's working in the life of every one of these guys, and you're going to see it play out in the coming chapters and verses. But here we are. You can sense if you were in Jacob's position, you would be distressed. You would be worried, and he is. Verse 3. Judah says to him, the man. I want you to catch this. They've referred to uh, Joseph as Lord of the land, a couple of times, nine times in this chapter alone, they're going to refer to him as the man. <laughs> the man. The man said this. The man said this. The man says this. It is entertaining. They don't know his new name, um, apparently, but they do know he is the Lord of the land. They, don't know, they do know he is a very powerful man in Egypt. He is the man, and whatever he says goes. And Judah said to his dad, 
The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. What should catch your, catch your attention here is not that Judah spoke up or that somebody spoke up. The question is, why did Judah speak up? We would have guessed that Reuben was going to speak up. He's the oldest son. He's the firstborn of Leah and the firstborn overall. Now, we don't expect Simeon to speak up because he is in prison. So we don't expect him to speak up. But what about Levi, the thirdborn of Leah, the third overall? We would expect him to speak, speak up. He does not. Rather, what we find is that Judah speaks up. Judah engages his father. Judah's the one who begins to speak on behalf of everyone. You can see what he says. Dad, the man warned us. The man told us plainly, you're not going to see my face again unless you bring your brother here. It's not going to happen. Further, you'll see what Judah says, verse 4. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. There's the positive statement. Give us Benjamin, we're on the way. Give us Benjamin, we'll start loading up the donkeys. And how many donkeys do you think they took? Every donkey they could find, I suspect. <laughs> what about that three-legged donkey? Bring him too! They've got to bring as much grain back. If they've got money, they want the grain. They, they, as many donkeys as they could take, I suspect they brought. But you see what Judah is saying here. Dad, if you'll send Benjamin, we'll go, verse 5. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother's with you. You can see what Judah says. Dad, here's the deal. We'll go. We love you. We'll do it. But if you're not sending Benjamin, we are not going. The, what will happen, Dad, the unstated point is he already told us we would all be thrown in prison. He already told us he would treat us as spies, capital offense. He would kill us. We can't go down, Dad. What you're going to have if we go down is just Benjamin, and you two will starve to death. That's what's going to happen. It will not work, Dad. That plan will not play. We're not going to do it, Dad. Love you. Not going to happen. Verse 6. Israel said, Jacob, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? <laughs> so you can see Dad's like, this is your fault. You're always running your mouth. Why did you even bring up the brother? Why were you talking to him about that? Why didn't you stay focused on getting the grain? This is your fault. You guys are always just running off at the mouth. Why did you do this and do this against me? Why did you treat me so badly? That's what Jacob said. You can see it, right? He's hurting. He's afraid. He's scared. Fear is the antithesis of faith. Fear will cause us to look right over faith. Fear will cause us to miss walking in faith altogether. He is afraid, and we see it. We hear it in the words, verse 7. Now, who's been engaging him up to this point? Judah. They replied. So he levels this accusation about what they said, and they all, we don't know how many replied. We don't know how they did it, but it was more than just Judah now. They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? So they reply in some type of group. They're like, no, no, dad, that is not how it played out. He started asking us very precise questions. He started asking us careful questions. He started being very precise. He said, do you have another brother? And of course, we said, in fact, we do. He's with his dad. Well, tell me about your dad. He started asking very precise questions, and we were just answering them. How could we have ever known? He would then look at us and say, go get your brother. We couldn't have known that. We were just answering the man's questions. Oh, okay, you, you advanced me. All right, verse 8. So Judah's talked to dad. Dad's talked to the group. The group has talked to dad. Now Judah picks it back up, verse 8. And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. 
Listen to what Judah just said to his father. He said, send the boy with me. We'll go. We'll get food that all of us don't die. You see, that's how serious it is. And it's a month-long journey from the time you initiate. You need a month of food to get, just to go there and get back to survive. You can't just run it to the edge and Judah's telling his dad, Dad, you need to send the boy that we can all live. You're setting on the dime, we're all going to die. Verse 9. Then Judah says this, as he continues to interact with his father. I will be a pledge for his safety. From my hand, you shall require him if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Judah looks at his father and says, I will be the surety. I will be the guarantee. I will be the pledge that this boy comes back here. I myself will serve as the security deposit. Now looking at verse 9, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says, the better way to translate verse 9, particularly the back half, if I don't bring him back to you and set him before you, then I have sinned against you forever. Go ahead, Kitty. Kitty has a question. Haven't they already done that? They have. They have sinned against their father. But now what he's saying is, I will take the blame upon me personally. Fruchtenbaum further goes on to say that what he is saying carries with it the consequences of being cut off from any and all inheritance. Judah was saying that he would be willing to be cut off from any and all inheritance, which would be sizable at this point in time. Furthermore, any of Judah's present money, present property, would become the property of Jacob. He was saying, I will serve as surety. I will bear the sin myself if he doesn't come back with me. You can cut me off completely, Dad. I will be the guarantee. Janice has something. Rich, isn't the boy Benjamin 30 at this point? He is. Okay. I'm just curious why they're referring to him as a boy. It's just the Hebrew. Um, he is a man. He's a 30-year-old man with 10 children. Baby of the family. But he is the baby of the family. He is number 12. One other question. Why does Jacob tell them, go down? No, not Jacob. Israel tells them, yeah, go down and buy a little bit of grain. It takes a month. Well, so when he's saying a little bit, he's saying like half a truck, truck ton of grain. So he's not saying go buy like a small bag of grain. Yeah. Buy, buy grain that we may live is what he's saying. Now, as you think about all of this, I want you to flash back to who Judah is. Just for a moment. If you remember, it was there in Dothan, not Dothan, Alabama, Dothan. When Judah said to his brothers, what profit is if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. This is the same Judah who hatched the plan to sell Joseph into slavery. That's the Judah we're talking about. This was the Judah who hated his brother so much because of the way his father loved him and the multicolored coat he gave him that he couldn't even speak peaceably with him. That's the Judah we're talking about. Oh, while we're here talking about Judah, let's talk about the Judah we're talking about. We're talking about the Judah who, as he thought he was having, as he thought he purchased a cult prostitute, had sex with his daughter-in-law unknowingly. That's the Judah we're talking about. And before I go to Nan's question or statement, I want to say one thing. Look how much this Judah has changed. The first Judah hated that his dad loved his brother more than him. It created in him so much anger and animosity that he sold his brother into slavery for it. This Judah looks at how much his dad loves Benjamin and says, I'll bear the guilt if I don't bring him back. I would argue that these 22 years have been changing Benjamin and his brothers as well. The dirty little deed they did in Dothan, Alabama, and the confession you saw last week was real. That has changed them. They're very regretful for what they've done. God has worked in their lives, and this is a different Judah than the Judah we saw 22 years ago. The Judah who slept with his daughter-in-law as he thought he was hiring a cult prostitute. But Nan has a question. Um, or statement. That could be, but Judah had 
that I think right before that. Say that again, Nan. I couldn't quite hear you. The scripture right before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just go. It goes forward. I'll have it there. Okay, I got one there. So my question is: You think that he sent him into slavery as opposed to he saved him from being killed, and that was the alternative? Well, if you remember the so great question, Nan. Thank you for that. If you remember the whole story, and I didn't give you the whole story because we can't tell every story, retell every story. If you remember the way it played out, Reuben is the one who wanted to save him. Reuben, remember, they were going to kill him. They said, here comes the dream master. Here comes the dreamer. And they intended to kill him. And Moses told us that Reuben said, no, 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 don't kill him. Throw him in the pit. And then Moses gave us the color, the sub story, because Reuben intended to get him back to his dad. Reuben intended to save him. So here they're still having this whole story, and then Judah hatches the plan to sell him into slavery. But Reuben had already convinced them not to kill him. Just throw him in the pit. Just leave him there. Let him die of natural causes. Just leave him there because what Reuben was thinking, I'll go fetch him. <laughs> you boys just put him there let him die of natural causes. He'll ultimately starve to death or die of dehydration or whatever, but he was going to get him out. But by the time Reuben got back, he was gone. Remember last week, Joseph heard the story. They were talking. Reuben said, I told you not to sin against this boy like this. Look what you've done. His blood is required at our hands. They were saying that in Hebrew or some other Semitic language. Joseph was listening to them in Hebrew because he was their brother, and he was hearing their open repentance. Here we're seeing further proof that God has been at work in Judah's life for sure. Hopefully that answered all the questions. Oh, I'm sorry, George. Here. Um, I just want to make the argument that I think you're being a little kind to Judah. He, he's doing what he has to do to get the food. Uh, he's he's just he, he's if he doesn't get the food, they they all start. So he's doing what he has to do. So I'm not sure he's just being a good guy here. So of course, George, you're right. At this point in the story, I have the advantage. I know what else Judah does. So I am sort of. And, and Sandy has sworn me to secrecy not to say it with my outside voice today, <laughs> not to ruin the story by telling you. What, um, but what we're, but you're right. If we were to just right here, we could not be sure. But I, I, I give you a promise. You're, when, when it's all done, you're going to God has changed that boy. Spoken like a true attorney. Um, <laughs> but again, Sandy made, me, Sandy made me take an oath of don't bring that up yet because I was talking to her about it. She goes, don't say that in class. Do not say that in class. <laughs> Ju Judah is... Uh, one of those individuals that make it tough to preach the sermon of the prodigal son to a audience of faithful sons and daughters. Uh, secondly, uh, it's interesting how Moses flips between Jacob and Israel. And so you're, you're hearing about Jacob and then all of a sudden you hear about Israel. And thirdly, uh, this is a case where you can make the case where uh, Israel is turning turning his children, his, his two youngest children, into idols. He's worshiping, uh, particularly worshiping Benjamin, and he's being called to be Israel and to release his son. Amen. I agree with everything you said, Rich. Absolutely. We talked about this in the earlier class, but look how Judah's responding. Not the way he responded with Joseph. And I just want to remind us, um, again, this is Galatians, this is New Testament, but I want to remind us the works of the flesh are evidence, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, and fits of anger. You see, what we saw in Judah before was a man operating in the flesh. No doubt about it. We saw it with Tamar. That was who he was 22 years ago. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I would argue as this story continues to unfold, we're going to see that God has been at work, not only in the life of Joseph, but in the life of Judah and all his brothers as well. Um, yes, Amy. To go back just a minute, you know, um, uh, Jacob really wanted Rachel. That was who he was in love with. And then the whole thing happened with Leah. But, and so his only two sons from the woman that he loved dearly, one of them's gone. Now he's looking at losing the other one. Um, and two, they have lost their mother. So he has watched the older child and husband, seven or eight, when she died, 
he suffered the loss of his mother. And then now Benjamin has to be raised by uh, another woman who is not, you know, his mother. And so he has uh, also probably a lot of compassion also within his little four member family unit, um, you know, with which with is dwindling Jason, by the day, <laughs> um, Benjamin and Rachel and him, that was their little family unit. So um, I don't know, if, you know, I don't want to disagree with him as idols, but that's why I think it's, it's so precious. That's only Benjamin's the only thing left of Rachel that he has. No doubt. Verse 10. If we had not delayed, this is Judas still, still speaking, we would have returned twice. That's where I got the idea at the start that I said it's been about two months, right? We would have returned twice. Well, if it's 34 days for a one trip, then 68 days for two trips, we'll just round down and call it a couple of months. So that's where I got that idea. So the stage is now set. Again, we looked at the mileage from Hebron uh, to Cairo. The stage is now set for chapter 43. Any questions before we advance the story? Okay, verse 11, maybe verse 11. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choicest fruits of the land in your bags, carry a present down to the man, a little balm, a little honey, some gum, some myrrh, some pistachio nuts, and some almonds. I'll be honest with you, when I read this story, and Sandy, forgive me, this reminds me of my, of my wife so much, Grandma Sandy. Grandpa Jacob says, let's pack up a bag, a little goodie bag for him. <laughs> um, but we get what he's doing, right? He's afraid. He's fearful. As far as they understand, they've stolen money. They haven't paid for the grain. And he's now just trying to do everything he can to hedge his bets. He's really come to the end of himself. And I would argue when God gets us there, that's when he can do some of his greatest work. When we can't fix it ourselves. You see, the truth is we can't fix it ourselves. It just sometimes takes us a little bit of time to realize that. And God has brought Jacob to the certainty that he cannot fix this by himself. So he's packing up this little goodie bag it includes, obviously, things that would be highly valued in a famine. Choice fruits, balm, honey, gum. That's from local trees. Myrrh, that's a special gum. Uh, you see it in Exodus 30, 23 as part of the holy anointing oil. Pistachio, nuts, and almonds, probably very rare during a famine. All of this of particular value during a famine. It is interesting to note, as you think about three of these products, the Ishmaelites who were traveling to Egypt, they were carrying with them gum, balm, and myrrh. So apparently Joseph understood that these commodities had value in Egypt. He's including them as the gift that goes down to the man. Verse 12, the man. In fact, not only pack up the goodie bag for the man, but take double the money with you, carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks, perhaps, or sacks Perhaps it was an oversight. So he says, not only that, not only do you make the goodie bag that we're going to give to the man, but take the original money as well as new money to buy. Now let's think about this for a moment. So there were 10 brothers that went to Egypt, so they had 10 units of money, and they bought 10 loads of grain. They each paid for a load. We now left one behind, Simeon, and we're going to send one additional, that's Benjamin, so we now have 10 more brothers going. And those 10 brothers are going to carry double the money. They're going to carry 20 units of money. Would we agree? Yeah, no problem. It is interesting to note that when they sold their brother into slavery, they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. I don't know if it means anything. It is the exact same Hebrew word, by the way. But I have no doubt that one was units of money. The other was probably coins. But just I wanted you to see it's the exact same number that they sold their brother for. Verse 13. Take also your brother and arise and go again to the man. So finally, he says, just do it. He probably feels helpless. He probably feels at the end of his rope. He probably doesn't know what to do, but he has no choice. He's going to starve to death if he doesn't. Uh, he feels helpless, but I would remind him what we know to be true. You see, as David said, it, our help comes from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. That's where our help comes from. Never forget that. There's no situation, there's no circumstance bigger than the one who created all things. But here he is, really at the end of his rope. Verse 14, and then he prays a short prayer, 
a one-liner. We probably all do that, right? You come in the middle of the day, a little quick one-liner. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he send back with your other brother and Benjamin. Send you back with your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I'm bereaved of my children, I'm bereaved. Now here it is, I suspect, where God wanted him to be. We finally got Jacob right where God wanted him to be. It reminds me of a little joke the pastor told. I don't remember the whole joke, but I can get you to the punchline pretty quick. You'll get the joke once you hear the punchline. There's pastors who are sitting around, they're talking about a problem that's going on. And one pastor says, well, let's try this. And they try that and it doesn't work. And another pastor says, well, let's try this. And they try that and it doesn't work. Another pastor says, let's try this. And they try that and it doesn't work. And then one of the pastors finally says, let's pray. And then one of the pastors looks at him and says, do you really think it's gone to that already? <laughs> yeah, it really has gotten to that already. And guess what? I think for sure, if it hadn't gotten there already with Jacob, it just got there. And he cries out a very small little prayer, but let's walk through it. May God Almighty. Anybody know the Hebrew here? El Shaddai. May El Shaddai, may the mighty God, may God Almighty. We'll get to what he says in a moment, but I would remind you, when we started the lesson in Genesis, I put up a document in the miscellaneous documents called 10 Titles of God in Genesis. Now, there's more than 10. I just read, cherry-picked 10 that I want to talk about. Um, but one of them was El, and another was Shaddai. Here we find these two combined into the title El Shaddai, the mighty God. Now, where did Jacob get the idea that Yahweh is El Shaddai? He is the mighty God. Well, we know where he got it. The first time it's used is in Genesis 17. Abraham was 99 years old and Yahweh appeared to him. And guess what Yahweh said to him? I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. The next time we see it, Isaac is sending Jacob to Padan Aram following the whole debacle with Esau and the birthright. Esau is wanting to kill his brother. This whole debacle is going on. Isaac sends him to Mesopotamia. He sends him to Padan Aram, and here's what he says. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Take as your wife from there, one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother, God Almighty, El Shaddai, bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you. Jacob would be in Padan Aram for 20 years before he would leave. Seven years Leah, seven years Rachel, six additional years. He is leaving. Here's what we read. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is no longer Jacob. Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. I am the mighty God. Here's the point before we go any further. The God we serve is God Almighty. He is the mighty God. There is no situation, there is no circumstance, there is nothing in your life that's bigger than the creator of heaven and earth. And here in this little short prayer, Jacob refers to God by the name that God referred to himself to Jacob. And he said, may God Almighty, and here's his point two, may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. May he grant you favor before the man. May he grant you compassion before the man. Now think about this. Jacob does not know that the man is Joseph. He does not know the man is his son. He believes the man is an Egyptian, a powerful Egyptian, a slightly rough and mean Egyptian who locked up one of his brothers. Not a very nice guy. He's a polytheist. He worships a host of gods, and he believes the Pharaoh's a god. That's who he believes this man is. And he says, may El Shaddai grant mercy with that man. Here's what he's saying. I want the creator God to so move on that pagan's heart that he will let my boys come back. Can God do that? Can God move in the life of a pagan person? Someone who doesn't know him? Someone who would never do his bidding? Someone who would never do what he wanted to do? Can God do that? Well, man, it'll be a long time before we get there. 
But the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, said it this way in Proverbs 21. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As rivers of water, he turns it whithersoever he will. You see, God can move upon the heart of any pagan person to accomplish his will and his glory and to the move for the good of his body and his church. Absolutely he can, and that's what our brother is praying would happen here. He just doesn't realize that that man is his son. That's the only place he's not up to speed. But point number three in this quick one-liner prayer, may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. He didn't say, may God bless your trip. Of course, we want God to bless the trip. He said, may God do this. And I would argue sometimes we need to pray for specific things we're asking God to do. Skip the generalities. God, will you bless this family and say, God, here's where I'm asking you to move. Because when we do that, then we know when God moved. We can be absolutely certain God answered our prayer. God stepped into the middle of the disaster and moved. Verse 14. As for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. If I'm deprived of my children, so be it. Now, let me say something. Of course, we all submit to God's will. Of course, His will be done. We probably say that many times when we pray. We probably say, Lord, I'm asking you to do this, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I would just say, as I read this, that doesn't seem like that. This doesn't seem faith-filled. It seems sort of fatalistic. It seems like, well, just do whatever. If, if, if I lose him, I lose him. And I would just remind us, faith is confidence in God. Ask God whatever it is. Just ask Him. And you, can and you should tag along, but ultimately your will be done because ultimately we want His will to be done. It is the best. I would just remind us what the writer of Hebrews said, without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. I'm not sure that he was exercising faith in the final piece of his prayer, but nonetheless, um, you see his prayer. It started out grand for sure. Verse 15. So the men took the present, they took double the money with them and Benjamin, they arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. You can imagine the 17 days, they've got Benjamin with them, they've got a pack load of donkeys, they're back there at the granary, they're back there standing before Joseph. Any questions before we advance the story? Way over <laughs> I'm going to take this opportunity for a drink of water. Good morning. Um, is it possible that he was just restating the fact of his current grief that it never left him? It is. Yeah. And, I, and I don't, if, I'm too, if I turn out, if, you know, if I'm too hard on him, that's definitely not my goal. And if what he's praying is, Lord, your will be done, then hopefully he forgives me for my confidence. <laughs> hey, Rich, the... Um... When you look at the story in Genesis here, we see many of them come down, just like Abraham, taking Isaac for the sacrifice. We find ourselves in that same space day after day. You know, is God God or is he not God? You know, he had to promise that they would become a multitude in the same state of that. So what, what do we do in that? We just can only give it to him. And see, Mike, that's the whole point, right? Hopefully we learn these lessons the easy way and not the hard way. Hopefully we can read these stories, make these applications, and say, okay, now, Lord, I get it. Even when it doesn't look like you're working all things together for my good, you're working all things together for my good. <laughs> I, I lay hold of truth. I don't, see, I don't believe what I see with the natural eye. I believe what you say. So absolutely. And hopefully those are lessons we can learn the easy way. Verse 16. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, so you can picture his first test has been answered. The boy is alive. The boy's not been sold into slavery. There he is. Now, he was a child. You know, he's young, young, not a child. He was a young man, seven, I guess, ish. But here he is. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, bring the men into the house, my house, and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. 
So you can imagine what's going on here. He sees him. The first question is answered. He looked at the steward. Take those men. Take them to my house. Slaughter an animal. We're going to do lunch together. Now, let's be honest. This would be highly unusual. It would be highly unusual for the second most powerful man in Egypt to invite over to lunch 10 Hebrews who he's only met one time, who he has nothing about, and now he's bringing them over for dinner. This would be highly unusual for everybody involved. True, but it is a beautiful picture of something. Jesus said this in the Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and he eat with him and he with me. You see, what he was wanting is to spend time with his brothers. What he was wanting is to have a meal with his brothers. Now, they didn't realize he was their brother. He wanted fellowship with his brothers. You ready for this? Jesus wants to die for your sins if you're not saved. He wants you to give your life to him. But he doesn't end there. He wants fellowship with you. He wants to enjoy company with you. He wants to get to know you and you to know him. He wants a relationship with you. And here, as Joseph is inviting these men into his house, we see a beautiful reminder of Jesus. I mean, let's be honest. Joseph could have said, listen, I'll keep you alive. I never want to see you again. I'll keep the grain coming, but you can take your little self back to Canaan. I have nothing to do with you. But that's not how a man filled with the Spirit behaves. Verse 17. Verse 17. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. We can picture it. They make the trip to the house. They can see it coming. Somewhere along the line, they learn it's Joseph's house. Maybe because it was so big. Maybe because the steward said, oh, look, here we're coming upon Joseph's house. And they're going, what? Now, you can imagine they're beginning to think, why would this powerful Egyptian invite us to his house? This is highly abnormal. So let's read what they say. Verse 18. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was placed in our sacks the first time that we were brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us his slaves and seize our donkeys. When I shared it with my wife, you know, you have to laugh. You're about to be locked up as a slave and he's going to steal our donkeys too. But don't miss the grander story. These boys, as they're approaching his mansion, they're wondering, why are we here? Why would the second most powerful man be bringing us to his home? They conclude it's because it's here he's going to fall upon us, he's going to seize us, and we're going to become his slaves because of that money. It's because of the grain we stole that we didn't pay for. It's payday, and guess what? They became afraid. I've said it a thousand times. Fear is the antithesis of faith. They become afraid. Verse 19. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house. Now, you can picture this in your mind. The steward's going, y'all come on in. They're like, no, 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 we need to talk. You come on back out. Let's talk. We got to talk to you. Because they're expecting, they're going to walk in the door, and they're about to to get seized and, and become slaves. So they begin to interact with the steward at the door of the house. Verse 20. And said, oh, my Lord. We came down for the first time to buy food, and when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, so we brought it again with us. So they begin rehearsing the story. They cut out a lot of details because it was actually two-phase, but they just get right to it. They say, listen, we opened our bags, and there was all the money, but don't worry, we brought it all back. Do not worry, we got all that money with us. We're not sure what went down. We're not sure how it happened. We had nothing to do with it. We brought it all back. Verse 22. And we brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put the money in our sacks. So he said, listen, don't worry. We got all the original money. We got fresh money. We don't know how this happened, but we got all the money to bring back. Now, you're the steward. What would you say? Okay, good. You get to live. Or... Oh, wow, I'll keep the extra 10. I don't know what you'd say. Let's see what this steward says. Verse 23, uh, not 23a. He, that's the steward, replied, Shalom. Peace be to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father, your Elohim and the Elohim of Jacob, has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. 
Now, <laughs> Deb, your face said it all. I can't imagine what the, their brothers look. Their face looked like that. Here is this interpreter, this Egyptian who's been interpreting for Jake or for Joseph. He's taking them to the house. They're on the porch, all afraid, all in a tizzy, and he says, "Shalom, peace." Shalom is one of the richest words in the Hebrew language. It's one of those multifaceted words. I wrote down just a few words it can mean. Peace, wholeness, soundness, health, prosperity, shalom. It's like if you've ever been to Hawaii and you say aloha, it can mean hello or it can mean goodbye. You can walk up to someone and say, thank you, brother. You can say shalom. You can walk away from someone and you can say shalom. You can say shalom in the middle of a conversation, peace. Prosperity, wealth, blessing. This Egyptian servant looks at them and says, Shalom. Then he says, Do not be afraid. He's watching them shake in their. Am I in the right place? Oh, okay. <laughs> he says, Do not be afraid. They are quaking in their boots, and this Egyptian servant says, Do not be afraid. Then look what he says. I was going to show you a few verses. We'll just skip them. They're in your notes. Multiple verses where God over and over again tells us not to be afraid. Again, we've, we've said it a whole lot, but here this servant says, do not be afraid. Thirdly, he says, your God, your Elohim, and the Elohim of your father, who's Jacob, has put the treasure in the sacks for you. Dude, you're a polytheist. What are you talking about, Elohim and Elohim putting money in our bags? What are you saying? And I do wonder, don't you, if Jacob had been sharing Yahweh to his servants. If Jake, or excuse me, Joseph, all these J words. If Joseph had been sharing Elohim, Yahweh to these servants, and here this servant is saying, don't worry, and Christian has a question, don't worry, your God and the God of your father has put your treasure in your sack. Didn't you also say earlier um, that uh, the Hebrews, because they were shepherds, that the Egyptians like wouldn't even have anything to do with them because they thought them even below servants, so to be invited in a house like this would be just unheard of? Did, did you mention that? I did, and we're going to see it next week. So next week, not to just to let you know what's going to happen because of Christian's, Christian's question, we're going to see that uh, Joseph is going to dine alone. The brothers are going to dine by themselves, and the Egyptian servants are going to dine by themselves. Why? Well, the Egyptian servants can't dine with Jacob because, or Joseph, rather, because they know he is a Hebrew. Everybody knows he's a Hebrew there. He can't dine with them, his brothers, because he is enrolled as an Egyptian, and they would like, dude, why are you dining with us? And they can't dine, and the Egyptians can't dine with them because they're Hebrew. So we have three different groups dining. You're going to see it clear enough, and Moses is even going to tell us, Christian. Great question. Thank you for that. Thank you, brother. Five minutes. And then point number four of what he said, I received your money. I have no idea what he meant. What he meant. Did he mean that uh, Joseph paid for them? Did he mean, listen, I got the 20 weights of money. I got the 20 units of money. I don't know, but you can see he says all of this to calm them down. He says all of this to bring comfort. And then verse 23b, am I at 23b? I am. He brings out Simeon and presents Simeon to them. Now, I don't know if Shalom calmed them down. I don't know if do not be afraid calmed them down. I don't know if the God of your money put your money in your sack. I don't know if that calmed them down. I don't know if he said, I got your money, don't worry. But I bet you when they brought out Simeon and put him among the group, for the first time in a good bit, those brothers felt a measure of peace, a measure of shalom. And John has a question. Uh, yeah, really, it's a comment. It, Joseph was the one who ordered the money to be put back in the sacks. He is. The steward was probably in possession of the money, right? <laughs> so, so my thought was, He's telling them that he's the one who put the money in the sack when he said, I received the money. He was holding their money, and Joseph ordered him to put it back in the sack. Yeah, so maybe he was just saying, I got your money. Yeah. And then the subtitle is, oh, and I put it back in your bag, but it doesn't go there. <laughs> yeah, there it is, John, to go to your point. Okay, verse 24, and we're down to just a couple of minutes, so we'll go through it. 
And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet, and when he had given their donkeys fodder, so imagine this, they've calmed down, Simeon's back, they come, they come into the house. They're now ready to enter the house. He gives them water to wash their feet, and then he goes and feeds their donkeys. Now that would have been a significant task. We've already determined they probably had more than two donkeys, or more than 10. They had a lot of donkeys. The servant feeds them all, verse 25. And they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there with him. So now they begin to put together the gift basket that Grandpa Jacob had, had assembled. And they wait because they now learn they're going to have dinner with the second most powerful man in Egypt. They're going to enjoy a time of dinner with him. My, how things have changed in just a second. It was just a moment ago we were on the door post, we were on the porch of the house being worried about sold, being sold into slavery and our donkeys being seized. And we're now preparing the gift to have dinner with the most powerful man in Egypt. It reminds me of something my wife reminds me of all the time. God can change things on a dime on a dime. Trust him. Walk by faith. Believe him. He can turn it around at any time in a way you could have never imagined. And he is not done turning this one around. He's turned it around, but he's got more to turn around. Okay, so I don't bury the lead. Our brother Joseph has two more tests. He needs to make sure that these men are not the men that sold him into slavery. He has two more examinations that they're going to take in the coming chapters. But as we leave here, as we leave the story for this week, they're in his home. They're prepared to have dinner, lunch, the biggest meal in Middle Eastern culture, with the second most powerful man in the nation. And he will be home soon, and that's where we'll pick up, Lord willing, next week. I have one, one minute. Any questions or statements? Okay. I'll pray this out the door. I have one question. Oh. Was Benjamin's family, Benjamin's the son, his kids the beginning of the Muppets? <laughs> you saw their names, right? They were, they were a cute little set of names, right? Let's pray. Father, we thank